familiar to me. You've been on... Um, hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us and welcome Kennedy to Hall. episode four of the right. Mask show, Catholic Masculinity show. What we are doing with this project is helping you reconnect your, your roots to resist and rebuild the current degeneracy of Western culture. We've covered a couple of points in the podcast so far. Number one, patriarchy is ruled by fathers and feminists promoted promiscuity to undermine it. Promiscuous men are feminists. Episode two was about the family as the fundamental social cell. All attacks on marriage are attacks on the family and hence on society more broadly. Feminists attacked male authority via the family. Episode three, we covered how we now, all of us as Catholics, have far more in common with Andrew Tate now that he is a Muslim. Muslims and Christians both worship the one true God. But whatever is true in Islam is ultimately in Catholicism. And Islam doesn't have the whole truth. Jesus is the way. And in today's episode, number four, we will be looking at how Jesus represents peak masculinity, a very misunderstood topic today. And with me to discuss that, I have three fine gentlemen. Timothy Gordon literally wrote the book on this topic, The Case for Patriarchy. Tim, thanks for joining us. Thanks a million, Will. Great to see you, bro. A little bit about you and your work quickly before we get underway. Well, the project most recently has been about restoring the patriarchy to the extent that that's a humongous project. Here's, here's to beginnings, right? I've also, I started out uh, with a book called Catholic Republic, which explains states' rights integralism, something that's not popular at the moment either. And I have a book entitled uh, Rules for Retrogrades after the podcast. My newest book is with Michael. Uh, don't go to college. But I'd say the most important thing I'm working on now is the case for patriarchy, which came out not very long before don't go to college. So I, I've kind of given short shrift to pushing it, which is why I'm so excited about this podcast. It, you know, I, I love doing this with you guys. It's an honor. And this is show four. I'm excited to see what will come of rebuilding Christian masculinism. It's where, where my heart lies at this point. Yeah, excellent. Here. I'm fully behind all of that. And this is the big topic, what Jesus represents for men today and why it's been so confused. We also have strong man and mentor to millions of men, Elliot Hulse. Elliot, thanks for joining us. Honored to be here, brother. Uh, Elliot Hulse, strong man, strength coach, king of making men strong. Been on YouTube since 2006 making videos for men who want to grow stronger in the gym. And that has evolved into helping their souls become sanctified and stronger through Christ. And so to be here with you guys is an incredible honor. And, uh, I look forward to this conversation. Brilliant. You can't strengthen your body without also strengthening your mind and soul. Ultimately, it's all part of the same thing, isn't it? That's right. That would be a perverted form of strength. Not complete, but uh, but less than what we're made for. And people who've watched the three previous episodes will notice that our friend Dr. Michael Robillard, Army Ranger, MMA fighter, is missing today. He is on a retreat. And we have Tim's friend Joe with us instead. Joe, my first time meeting you, so I know nothing about you. What brings you here? Nice to meet you, Will. Yeah, I've been on with Tim uh bunch of times i do a basically a weekly show with kennedy hall i do uh some writing over at one peter five uh, i'm not an mma fighter i do train jujitsu and lift a bunch of weights though so i mean i have a little bit of that going on so uh yeah right. it's not nice to be here for the first time <laughs> good to have you good to have you yeah so i want to lay down two concepts in particular just to start the discussion guys and this is what we observe about the nature of masculinity just across the world, all different cultures, all different religions. So we're going to take that as our starting point. And there are a couple of big things I want to draw attention to. David Gilmore, in his book, Manhood in the Making, a cross-cultural study of men across the world, points out that men nurture their societies by shedding their blood, their sweat, and their semen, by bringing home food for both child and mother 
by producing children and by dying, if necessary, in faraway places to provide a safe haven for their people. Any initial thoughts on that? Men nurture their societies by shedding their blood and dying, if necessary. Sound familiar to you from great films, stories? Does this ring true? I just like to think biologically in terms of what a man does. And we pour out ourselves into the world. We literally, physically pour ourselves into women, even demonstrated through the conjugal act. And so the woman being the opposite of that is the receiver. And so in the way that Christ is the head of the church, the, uh, the son, and like the son, pours life-giving energy into the earth so that it can produce and so it can uh, sustain human life. Uh, we are made in his image and we are sons in that regard. Yeah, men are self-giving. And this can involve self-sacrifice. Think of the role of the soldier, for example. There's no country that's conscripted women into frontline combat. Men are expected to die in defense of their communities. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, guys, that as all of the European nations at first began to get women in the military, none, none of them wanted in frontline combat. This is still understood around the world, even with feminism making all the gains over the last 50 years is a uniquely male province. I really like what Elliot just said about man pouring himself forth. I've been doing Latin translations and it's Christ poured himself forth. Uh, the outpouring of Christ, the bridegroom for his church, the bride. But it, in this takes place in natural terms too. All of my favorite movies are about a man making a sacrifice, usually for his family, because that's closest to home. That's the, the, the least amount of abstraction involved pouring yourself out for your, your wife and your kids. Uh, my, my favorite movie of all time is the remake <clears throat> of 310 to Yuma. And it's literally about an ex soldier from the civil war who was ripped off in some sense by, by being injured in the civil war. But he, he doesn't feel so as he makes bigger and increasingly bigger sacrifices for his family. So we're always fighting. Yeah, we're fighting for flag. Uh, that, that's become an ab abstract meaning, but really we're fighting for our res publica, which is in the truest sense, it's our families. And to bring all my miniature vignettes together, the women are never going to be expected to do that, no matter how many gains feminism makes. It's in here, it's too central to being a man that even as the transsexuals make gains, not just the feminists who are proto transsexuals, but the transsexuals themselves. Uh, it's never going to be uh, something that, that women willingly conscript themselves into because it's so damn unpleasant. It sucks. It sucks. Yeah, That's and in us. purely natural terms as well, we look at biology. If the father dies, most of the time, the kid's going to be okay. If the mother dies, that's it. The infant will die with her. So this is why cultures have always tried to keep women out of combat, if possible. Joe, any thoughts on self-sacrifice and manhood, being exposed to danger, even to the point of death? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's uh, archetypical, you know, in the sense that, well, okay, uh, I was, you know, thinking of like the movie 300, for instance, you know, and you'd have Leonidas and, uh, you know, a small group of men going to take on, uh, you know, a whole uh, massive army. And this was looked upon as, you know, courageous and heroic. And this was just, you know, it's obviously not just the standard. Christianity becomes the fulfillment of that standard, really. Uh, it, it culminates in the figure of Christ, but it, it doesn't it doesn't begin Although, I mean, that there's probably a sense in which it does, but uh, culturally it doesn't begin with Christ. He is the epoch of it, um, only for this to kind of get uh, flipped on its head. So uh, in somewhat Nietzschean terms, which Nietzsche predicts uh, basically that it's it, it the opposite of love and the opposite of self-sacrifice is dominance. And uh, I think... 
I think we see a lot of uh, a lot of emphasis on dominance and power in uh, in modernity, and particularly uh, in in the I mean before Tate converted, uh, particularly in that realm, and definitely with some of these other uh, manosphere type of characters. Yeah, we'll talk more about that later. That's a great point, and one of well, the reasons why. One, can yeah, I Tim? add one academic nuance to the things that Joe just said? Yeah. You ready for this? It's going gonna, it's gonna to take a little bit of time to develop, but as counterintuitive as this may be, think about it this way. Women are super shitty at fighting. That's one more reason they shouldn't be in the army. So they're not good at fighting. That's it. That's <laughs> they, I would also say that a uh, society that conscripts its women or puts its women in the military is a depraved society. It shows that we are lacking uh, in resources. Why we put the, the means by which a society grows uh, women that give life behind the weapon of war uh, for it to be considered something empowering or trendy or cool uh, only shows how deranged we are as a society. Yeah, how a society treats its women is a measure of its spiritual health, which is why in Rome in its last stages, they had senators' wives put into the Colosseum to fight each other to death or to fight male dwarves to the death. That's how depraved and demonic things got. Now, the next point I want to lay down at the start about men across the world is this myth we see again and again in pagan literature of the descent into hell. So if we look in the classical epics, if we look at Beowulf, Old English epic, we've got this idea that the hero figure must descend into hell. And <coughs> it takes a few different stages. It's part of an initiation into suffering. And the boy who truly wants to become a man must undergo this. Now, obviously, we get the fulfillment of this in Christ's descent into hell and the defeat of Satan. But why, in some sense, does moving from being a boy to being a man involve this descent into hell? What is this connection between suffering and being a man and the rite of passage? I think it has something to do with our biological connection to our mothers. And that when we come into this world, it's understood that an unformed ego doesn't recognize that it's separate from its mother, both female and male. But there comes, of course, that first love object relation loss that both male and female experience where they realize, oh, I'm not my mother, a separate ego altogether. But then a separate one has to happen. So there's a second death uh, that's experienced by the boy when he recognizes that he's of a different gender completely. And I think that sense of uh, detachment from what we come from uh, and all of the sensual gratification and all of the um, comfort that's associated with that signifies a death for a man. And so we seem to repeat that pattern in multiple stages through our life where we sort of let go of what, you know, holds us attentive and attached to material. You know, the word mother coming from matter uh, is or even matrix is indicative of what we have to let go of in these various stages of our, our death and rebirth or initiation process. So the rite of you... passage is a, a, a separation from the feminine in a way, an exposure to danger. That's right. Sorry, Tim. Sorry, I was just gonna ask if any of you guys have heard Walter Kaufman's definition of tragedy, one of the most bastardized terms in the English language, no one understands it. You know what, how Walter Kaufman defines tragedy? How does he define it? So it's the uh, being caught between the natural law and a positive law of your land. That's what tragedy mm -hmm. is in the Greek sense. It's a great definition. So if you think of the Antigone or the Oedipus Rex or uh, my favorite, the Oresteia, there's something inherently tragic about life. You know, they say Plato and Aristotle killed tragedy insofar as they ratiocinated life. They made sense of it. Well, this isn't true at all. I still have a deep appreciation for, since Joe mentioned Nietzsche, I have a deep appreciation for Greek tragedy still. And I did mention the Antigone. You have a, a 
female protagonist who gets caught between the natural law and the positive law. So females can emulate what's masculine, but, but ultimately you ask, why do men have to walk through hell to be a man as a rite of passage? Well, usually they're being called to do so for either their faith or their family. And even as women emulate it, like the noble-hearted Antigone, it's, it's an inherently masculine thing to confront head-on, not at your husband's flank like a good wife does, but head-on the tragedies of life, being caught between unjust mankind who makes unjust positive laws and the natural law, which is even before Christ, our Savior. came to earth, Greek tragedians understood, which is as old as man, as old as man's interaction with God, you're going to be caught between the, the Scylla and Charybdis, as, as it were. And my favorite's the Oresteia, right? And not because Orestes has to kill his mother to avenge his father. That's, a, that's an effed up situation. I wouldn't want to be there. But because he faces true Greek tragedy, Walter Kaufman style tragedy, and he faces it down with such un, unflinchingness, unflappability. It's, it's an amazing thing. And so whether you're walking through actual hell or metaphorical hell, a man's job is to take the slings and arrows of the world on behalf of his family toward his faith or the betterment of his family. Yeah, paying the price of loyalty, having a spine and doing what's right, come what may. That's going to be a big theme when we look at Jesus in the Gospels later. Joe, thoughts about descending into hell as a man? Yeah, well, testing your mettle, right? I mean, how, how else are you going to find out if you're strong or not? You know, it, quite simply. Uh, if, you don't, if you don't do something difficult, uh, you're never going to find out if you're up for the task. You know, it, it's, it's a simple concept, but it gets lost. Uh, in mod, you know, in modern, like, parlance we have uh we kind of have to manufacture physical suffering but uh i think we undergo um put ourselves through a whole lot of uh psychological trauma so we've we've lost uh we've lost the sense i i forgot who said it i was i think it was uh i was probably i think i was listening to, to martyr maid and uh was talking about how Broadly speaking, our <coughs> our initiation rituals are almost completely gone unless you unless you do them unless really you do them voluntarily. Uh, I was thinking of something like jujitsu, where if like you know you go you get like a stripe on your belt or you go get a blue belt or something like that. That's something you do of your own volition. Yeah. But nobody's nobody's requiring a, a boy or a man to do that. Really, all that's required of a boy now is that he go to public school, uh, not yeah, basically be uh, docile. And, and eat terrible food that they give them. So it's actually, it's really the opposite. Right. I would also add that this process of initiation always fo follows, follows a pattern, a predictable pattern cross-culturally, that a movement away from the mother and an atonement with the world of the father. And, and given that we live in a world that's so uh, anti-father, it seems as if that process no longer fits the, the, the rule or the necessity of our society because to have an atonement with the father means well there is a god the father there is a father in our home and atheistic society has no need for that and so we've got a lot of boys that are attached still to the mother uh either through the mother themselves with a disordered relationship or attachment to all kinds of effeminacy video games pornography drugs alcohol sex tinder swiping and things of this nature is all a call for the mommy. It's all a, a, a reverting to the mother's breast and a wanting the comfort and satisfaction of material uh, gratification, where an atonement with the father is a movement away from all, all of this, all consumption, all uh, attachment to material. And once again, that doesn't serve our society because we live in a consumption-focused economy. And so we need men to consistently be attached to the things that give us good feelings as opposed to things that give us meaning. And uh, only the father can provide that meaning for us. Yeah. When, yeah. when we say effeminacy there, we mean it as St. Thomas Aquinas uses the term. So it's when man is swayed from what is right by hardship that is too much for him to bear. 
So it's a reversion to softness, like Elliot was explaining there. You aren't able to stick to the path of what you should be doing because you lack the fortitude. Um, Joe, the point you made about there not really being a rite of passage now and men having to seek out a hardship to try and find a substitute is one developed by Ernest Hemingway in The Sun Also Rises, one of the best modern novels about manhood and the search for it. Dialogue with a couple of characters goes like this. You know, it makes one feel rather good deciding not to be a bitch. Yes, it's sort of what we have instead of God. Now, this is really interesting because the connection between wanting God and wanting to not be a bitch is because on some level, all men crave the cross or something like it. We know that mm -hmm. that fulfills us. We're made for struggle. In a sense, all men are made to be crucified. And that's why we resonate to Jesus's message. So he provides us the ultimate example of not being a bitch. And what you see is that even in deformed form, this message, when it's just turned into machismo, gangsterism, still has its appeal because there's that tough guy element to it. What do you think of this idea that all these cravings for the cross or difficulty or proving ourselves in modern culture, because there's no rite of passage, are really a spiritual yearning? It's funny. Well, we either, and even if you don't crave it, you're going to get it anyway, you know? So you could, you could, you could not want to suffer all you want, but that that's well and good for you. The chances are you're going to, uh, and as, as much as you get rid of, uh, physical, like, you know, being tossed into the woods for however long, and then you have to kill a wolf or something like that. If you get, you, you know, you could get rid of that. Uh, that, do, that doesn't mean you're going to not, uh, you're not going to be, uh, traumatized in some way. And there are obviously people uh, capitalizing on this, uh, knowing knowing that men are you know, completely uh, feel completely without meaning. I mean, I think I think the first the first one to really come on the scene and do it was Jordan Peterson, but uh, I, I I don't know if his message didn't come up a bit short. And now you see, uh, uh, I mentioned Nietzsche specifically because you see guys like uh, Bronze Age pervert. Um, also, uh, you know, writing Bronze Age mindset, really uh, emphasizing uh, how, you know, the importance of strength and your own, like, vitality as a man, and then emphasizing Nietzsche, Nietzschean philosophy, which is, which misses the mark, but it's also not, it's also not completely incorrect. Like, there's, there's something, there's something there to it. Uh, it, it you know like anything it has to be it has to be baptized yeah error grows best in the shade of truth there's truth in nietzsche there's truth in what bronze age pervert presents but when it comes down to it men have the choice between aristotle or nietzsche ultimately those are the two ways of looking at the moral life and our ethos here is aristotelian for reasons we'll outline tim thoughts on joe's comment Guess who said this? The art of life is the art of avoiding pain, and he is the best pilot steers clear the rocks and shoals with which it's beset. That is our dearest revolutionary here in America, this side of the pond, well, uh, Thomas Jefferson. He did none of the sort. So it's easy to beat up on Jefferson because he was a proncophile. None of us like that, but... <laughs> um, he, he didn't do this. It's interesting. He took on the biggest empire in the world uh, and addressed the envelope from his personal address there at Monticello. They, they knew where he lived. They knew where to find him. So it's interesting that he would say the art of life is the art of avoiding pain. It goes squarely against the wisdom that, that you, you supreme gents are uh, offering here today and I'm offering. But uh, it's funny, he wasn't even, he was, a, he was a hypocrite when it came to avoiding pain. I think there's a, a kind of noble-browed man that doesn't at all avoid pain. He steers like an EMT worker on 9-11 or something. He steers toward the fire, not away from it. But then afterwards, this is my assessment of old Thomas Jefferson, after he's done so, 
he suffered so much that he actually says something like this that makes him sound like a biatch. You know, it makes him sound like he was the sort of common coward who avoided pain. Some guys just suffer so much that they, they might actually sound like they steer away from it when they don't. I think he said this after his wife died and he locked himself in his library for like three weeks and just was fainting with the, uh, with the pain of losing his beloved wife. But it's a really interesting question how I, it's to me, it's the most interesting question. When I was the closest thing to an atheist, uh, as a late teen, early twenties, I always connected with Dostoevsky, whose main theme is the shadow of the cross, the shadow of suffering and the redemptive value of it. And I always found that, not just when I read the Greek tragedies, but in Dostoevsky, it had a specifically Christian character. I found that the most beautiful thing in all literature, the most beautiful scene in any movie is the father-son sacrifice scene in 310 to Yuma. So it, it's got an uh, inescapable value the value of suffering in the life of human beings, particularly men. You can't avoid it if you try. That's where Thomas Jefferson's wrong. Yeah, that point about downplaying suffering is a really good one because sometimes some of the military heroes who have shown the most courage and daring will downplay their achievements the most. And they'll say it was no big deal and they won't want to talk about it. And I think there's something in that. War, to develop that point, is one of the ways in which men have throughout history best experienced this sense of sacrifice. And I've just picked out a couple of lines from some war memoirs from modern times to show this. William Broyles, who fought in Vietnam, said that war was an initiation into the power of life and death. Women touched that power on the moment of birth. Men at the edge of death. What an interesting remark. So men touch the transcendent on the edge of death. Women touch it at birth. Fascinating. Yeah, women, I always make the play on words that women suffer through labor pains. It's even the curse of Eve, curse of Adam. Labor pains, are, whereas men, we're called to suffer through our daily labors, our quotidian labors. And sometimes that does include going to war when your country's at war. So it's like a one and done deal for women. For men, it's an ongoing struggle every day. Yeah. And when we say that men touch the transcendent on the edge of death, it goes back to the idea of self-sacrifice. And Ernst Junger, German, writing in his memoir, Storm of Steel, says that there's nothing to set against self-sacrifice that is not pale, insipid, and miserable. So this is the highest ideal, and there's no substitute for it. As Joe said before, if we try to avoid it, it's going to come to us because I think it really is the way of men. I think in terms of young men, early teens, when testosterone starts to uh, bubble up in the body, so to say, and this propendency towards taking all kinds of wild risks. This is where they'll be driving most dangerously, taking risks with women, joining gangs, being most violent. And it's that instinct within us that wants to put our life on the line. It's that instinct within us that wants to be challenged and wants to face what could potentially be uh, a conclusion, right? Death. I mean, even in our pursuit for sex, what we're looking for is an end, right? There's this angst, there's this movement, there's this energy in my body that needs to be poured out somewhere. I pour it out sexually. I pour it out through uh, struggle and strain in the gym. The, there are pseudo means by which this is approached, right? Like through uh, the, the chasing of adventure and the chasing of violence that is not supportive to the society. But when not sought in the effort to remain under the uh, umbrella of safety and security in a world that wants to keep all men riding the white horse, um, if they do or we do or, or if we're called to the red horse, there's no eldership to show us how to handle that, that virility within us. Uh, but a man who avoids the red horse completely 
uh, he will be confronted with it at some point in his life through some form of, well, we use the word tragedy before, but in a sense, conflict or, 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 or uh, crisis <coughs> where God essentially is saying, uh, you need to stop being a boy and face some challenges so that you can learn how to uh, suffer, how to struggle, and how to ultimately handle the power that you've been given. Most young boys will look for this in sport, mainly nowadays. Joe's made this point about martial arts, gym. We're not going to be conscripted into the military, at least not right now. And national service is gone in many countries. So sports are where it's at for most young men. This is the arena where they get the experience of brotherhood, where they can sweat together, bleed together, cry together, where they can test their courage, where they can see if they can handle fear, can they handle pain, and they also get a sense of honor. And it's good to look at the ways in which sport can help men in that regard, but it can also become <coughs> a kind of idol. What are your thoughts on the significance of sport spiritually in our times? So I'll just point out what we're dealing with in terms of how sports have been perverted in a number of ways, beginning with this uh, idea that everybody deserves a trophy, that they're, you know, in schools, I've noticed that they're now having field days, you know, where they would be pinned against each other in competition, but nobody actually wins. Everybody is a winner. Uh, doesn't serve that longing uh, that's within. And then also this idea that men and women are equal. And now we find men and women competing in sports uh, where I don't I think it was uh, Stephen Arneo in his book, uh, Hard Times Create Strong Men, talks about how, well, we're in double bind when it comes to competing with women, because on one hand, well, we don't want to, we, we don't want to compete with women uh, that doesn't serve our ultimate end. And if we win against a woman, well, then who cares? You, you beat a girl. There's no, there's no glory. There's no honor in that. Uh, but if you beat a girl or if, or if a woman w wins over you, uh, you're a loser. It's double bind. Men versus women is lose, lose for men. Absolutely. This, this is a little preview of the show I want to do on my channel uh, next Friday about female sports, it's centrality to the globalist, to the Marxist. Um, it's the final step in the androgenization of, of women. And that's why it's such a big part of Agenda 2030. I don't know if you guys knew that it's uh, pushing female sports has a big section in Agenda 2030. Hmm. There was there was a it was about six months back. Elliot, you might have commented on this tweet of mine. Maybe I just imagined it. Cerno, you know, Mike Cernovich, did two tweets almost back to back. I normally, and I tend to agree with them. I, that's why I follow him on Twitter. I don't tend to follow a lot of people I don't agree with on Twitter. But he, he made a, a, a remark denigrating sports ball. One of these remarks that's become fashionable in some corners of the new right, saying like, oh, all sports are essentially effeminate. I don't think they include MMA, but I mean, I was a I was a basketball player. I was a sports ball player. I never I never fought MMA, but I'm like all sports are military training, like Will's insinuating here. And so he denigrated sports ball as like effeminate or some pastime that's bad for men. And I'm like, wow, this is a shitty take. But then, like the next day or someone within a couple days, he made some benignly. Uh, uh, advocacy type comment about um, a female MMA match that was on the TV, you know, where he said something like, oh, that was a hell of a match. We are like, this sounds like an endorsement. I, how do you <laughs> condemn football and basketball, which are military training, even if there's no direct strikes, out the one side of your mouth, and then out the other side of the mouth, you're actually praising the most perverse inversion of the closest sport to actual military training, which should be the most uniquely male. All sports are uniquely male though, which is why they're bad. As you get better at sports as a man, it's better for your body. It's better for your reproductivity. It's better for your mood. It's better for your testosterone. It's the absolute inverse for women. And I, I just wanted to 
I wanted to have Cernovich here and, and, and ask him these questions because it was so frustrating to hear him be so wrong. I'm looking forward it's to that discussion, Tim. Feminism is misogyny, ultimately. There's an oops upside your head for you. Feminism is misogyny because it fundamentally hates femininity and it wants to see it in the ring smashed up. Elliot, sorry. I was just going to say it's so interesting to see these very masculine men in many regards uh, MM, MMA fighters themselves and guys, you know, just tough guys, guys in the military and things of that sort, raise their girls to be boys. Uh, it's yes. almost as if they want to pour out their masculine uh, drive and excellence on their daughters. And I, you see so many of these young girls grow up wanting to fulfill their father's desire of them being a great man. Uh, it doesn't serve their daughter, doesn't serve other men, doesn't serve uh, the family at all. I, I love to see strong men raise feminine daughters. Uh, that would be that would be the best use of their authority in the family and their their uh, intentions for their daughters. Also, in raising their daughters in a way that they can recognize and appreciate an alpha male rather than compete with him, uh, it sets these girls up for ultimate failure in life. As a, as a corollary to that, this is, again, what I want to talk about next week, so I, I, don't, I don't want to be too tangential, but there's a corollary to that great point, Elliot, that you notice everywhere when you do watch MMA. All these tough, strong men who are top fighters that have been cucked into sitting around and pretending they're interested in the girl fight. That's like the varsity mm -hmm. team uh, at a really good you know, high school for football, taking an interest in like girls, Pop Warner and acting, it's Kabuki theater, acting really interested in what's going on in the Pop Warner game. It's, it's bizarre. And it's odd that so many really gifted athletes that would make some of the best warriors, particularly ones I've known, I've known some pro fighters that I was very close with. They're very, very blue pilled on this issue. One of my close friends, a pro pro MMA fighter, me and a couple of our other friends used to just give him a hard time. Like, how do you support female MMA? And he would go 12 rounds with us, no pun intended, about like, oh, here's, here's why if you respect the sport, girls can be good at this, this, and that. It's just ridiculous. I'm like, well, I respect my own sport, basketball. The WNBA is a joke. It's weird how brainwashed they are, but that's this is this is getting us too far afield. This, this is just a preview of what's going to come soon. Well, nice. to, to bring this back to Jesus and masculinity, then we have in him a figure who doesn't cuck whatsoever. We've got someone with the spine that can't be broken. And we're saying here about sports and war, even in peacetime, men still seek some form of war in their recreation and this is because uh being a man ultimately <coughs> is about leadership it's about seeking out struggle and it is wanting to save things there's a great book by the theologian james ditty called driven by hope men and meaning and he says that we men are gripped with a passion to control because we're gripped with a passion to save to save life from its sorrow by summoning the transcendent so this comes back to that point about all men really craving the cross. And the father knows that his role is to separate the child, separate his son from the safe maternal world and then send the boy out to face the dangers of life. Now, what does this story remind you of? Nowhere was this done more clearly than in the crucifixion and in the resurrection. When Jesus is lost in the temple as a little child, and he says that he must be about his father's business. This is that separation from the maternal that Elliot was talking about at the beginning of the podcast. And unlike uh, any of us, Jesus chose to be born. So this is the willing embrace of suffering, knowing what you're going into and taking it on fully. <coughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. It's an amazing point. I think of this image really strongly when I raise rise early and uh, pull my son. He's got six sisters, right? So I pull him away from 
the safety and the comfort in that the early morning darkness of his bed, the way his sisters and, and mom are doing when I bring my son hunting with me. I mean, he's only four, but we have to drive a half hour out to our land. We go get up in the, the deer blind. And uh, it's uncomfortable. And literally, Will, you keep making this point starkly. I'm, I'm actually like pulling him from his mother's side if it's one of those nights where he's climbing, climbed into bed with us. It's beautiful. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, that's been a practice of mine since my son turned 12. I had it in mind that that would be pinnacle year where he's now introduced to the world of the father, my world. And I've done the same thing. He gets up very early every morning with me while his sisters are still asleep and we train or we take, we've been taking very long hikes with the dogs now or, uh, you know, any of the other things that I do in order to uh, develop strength and commitment and discipline, uh, he gets to tag along and it's, it's a, it's a suffering of sorts because he would rather be in bed and I know that he's tired and he in the past would be woken up by the soft kiss of his mother and her <laughs> warm embrace. Or now I, he's got dad ripping his blankets off and, and patting him on his head <laughs> to get him out of bed. Yes. That's a sacrifice of sorts. So I'm happy that you guys uh, mentioned that. But it's still you love. You do it every day. Yeah, yeah. That's the yeah. father's love. It comes out in a different way because the man and the woman complement each other. The son needs both. It's funny, isn't it? In the Old Testament, when you look at David, when you look at Solomon, you see time and time again that men can fail as men, as fathers, by not maintaining their relationship to God because of a disordered love for women. So when the man mm. puts the woman first, doesn't have God first, then the trickle-down effect of that is that everything goes wrong because the man himself is effeminate in some way. And we've made the point in previous podcasts that feminism is ultimately male failure, is the male abdication of authority. And that really twist the knife when you see men believing the victim narrative and saying the women did it to us. Mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah, that I, dovetails into a big part of our conversation in terms of what is now portrayed as um, a mature masculinity. And, and it's always in reference to women these days. Well, where are all the women or where are all the material things? Where are all the niceties and comforts and luxuries of the world? that would define you as a man, as opposed to uh, struggle and challenge and mortification and austerities, the things that we're proposing. Right. Joe, you wanted to make a point about men abdicating authority. Well, yeah, I was actually uh, related to that and a prior point that you made about uh, men kind of uh, surrendering their vitality and uh, at, at the altar of not even femininity, but of like uh, j just women in a broader sense, uh, more in a carnal way. Uh, but uh, in a religious uh, framework now, I think we have a, that's like, yeah, that's a, it's not what women want. I mean, if we look, if you look at it biblically, uh, Christ's mission doesn't begin until, until Mary gives the go ahead. Uh, actually, mm. on, on two occasions. I mean, he does. He's not. He the the incarnation doesn't happen until Mary consents to it, and then his He doesn't go from his domestic life to his uh, to his mission as the son of God until Mary says, "Do whatever he says," at the wedding of Cana. So, and now we have men kind of. Uh, sacrificing themselves to uh and sacrificing their masculinity and vitality completely to you know pornography and things like this and uh sort of a desperation uh for the feminine which will you know in a sense we don't even we don't have good feminine examples or good masculine examples at all really for the most part um only for now the church to kind of provide and have us um being uh emphasizing mary through apparitions and her coming uh to yeah really warn us of sins of the flesh and things of that sort and seeing this coming and having her properly now as an avenue uh for salvation and for us to to reclaim being a man through mary which i think is important 
Yeah, I love it. That was awesome. Yeah, the the point about having no good masculine examples or feminine examples as a problem in the lives of so many children is because I think the sexual revolution disconnected being a man from fatherhood, disconnected being a woman from motherhood. That's one of the big effects of contraception, also trying to break down the traditional family unit where each sex has a particular role to play and they work together as a unit. Not many men understand themselves as potential fathers. Not many women now understand themselves as potential mothers. But on the deepest level, that is what being a man is. Husband, father. Being a woman is mother, wife. Take that away, take the family away, and people feel rootless. Even at the, the alternative. Level. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Tim. I was just going to uh, address the fact that the alternative is what we've got right now, which is a culture of death, where ultimately it's what can I do in order to YOLO my way through this experience, uh, get as much good feels and comfort as possible without the now. I think I, I remember hearing this week that um, uh, one of these fat black liberal women who's uh, running for something <laughs> in, uh, in Georgia says that abortion uh saves the world like it, the reason why we're having innovation and such is because we're not killing enough babies we're not living the the culture of death to its fullest and so the majority of people not realizing they're living in a way that's antithesis to life that's exactly right yeah <laughs> I, I love i love your last comment <laughs> so the abrams i think is her name stacy abrams <laughs> Stacey, right? yeah i i wasn't gonna jump in and say yeah the fat black uh georgian <laughs> whatever you said that's that's a beautiful remark and, it, and it's of course true uh yeah so the the father knows that he has to send the boy into danger and this is what god the father does with christ the son and from the beginning, Jesus has come not to bring peace, but a sword. So even his mere presence as a baby provokes conflict. We've got Herod mm. destroying all the male children of Bethlehem in an attempt to get this rival king. And then we don't see Jesus running from conflict in his life. He calls the Jewish authorities and the Pharisees a brood of vipers fit for hell. There's no sense mm. of appeasement <laughs> here. And then later on, we end with the sacrifice. And I think one of the best connections is in Ephesians 5, when Paul commands husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church, laying down his life for her. So the divine bridegroom fulfills masculinity as self-sacrifice. He does for the church what every man is supposed to do for his wife and for his children. Yeah, uh, the ubiquitous remark by fallen away Catholics or Christians is that there's no exemplar for men, no Christian exemplar for men, and there's no Christian exemplar for women. You guys made reference, uh, I think, in Will, in a particularly ingenious remark to the sexual revolution, which uncoupled natural sexual roles you know male should want to become a father female should want to become a mother that's beautiful that applies to everyone the way the natural law does because it applies to natural reason but even christians even among a subset of christians they say i didn't know that there was a, a christian exemplar for a man um it, a lot of christian women will say i didn't know there's a christian exemplar for a woman there is Jesus is the ultimate man. Mary is the ultimate woman. Did you know that in the Old Testament, there's a long lineage of the king and his mother? The king and queen are, is not always, not in some bizarre Oedipal sense, but the king and queen tradition in the Old Testament largely references, indexes to the king and his mother. So Mary who's a best known for the child that she birthed is the ideal woman, right? Barefoot and pregnant teen, teen mom is, is she's the ideal woman, uh, endlessly faithful and virginal. But the man is Jesus when Shia LaBeouf converted to Catholicism early this summer. And he went on Bishop Barron's podcast and he spoke about it. 
the main thing he said, the main uh, lo locution was, I didn't know Jesus was this manly. I thought maybe John the Baptist was the manliest early New Testament figure. I didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus is unendingly manly, and he can always be looked to uh, as an exemplar for men. Same thing my friend Nick said, who's a, a filmmaker. He came on, and he's reverting to the faith, and he said the exact same thing as Shia without even knowing it. He was like, I thought John the Baptist was more manly than Jesus. No way. John the Baptist is an Elijah figure, to be sure. He's manly. He eats locusts and honey, and he lives alone in the wilderness, but he's not as manly as his his cousin, Jesus. And, and Will, when you asked us to ruminate for today's show on what is most manly about Jesus, maybe this is my own disordered nature. I came up with that passage you just cited, Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 36. Do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. What you notice now, everywhere, even evident in my comment about tough, muscled men who are good fighters not wanting to upset the apple cart. These guys look like they should be ready to make a really, really anti-feminist remark, these MMA guys, but they're bizarrely peaceful. Men aren't supposed to be peaceful. We're supposed to be willing to upset the apple cart with our commentary. Yeah. And so this sense of, you know, taking responsibility is often poured out on us. Even those who might be listening will be saying, oh, sacrifice, sacrifice. Men are supposed to do things. But the corollary or I guess the other side of the coin would be the authority that Jesus takes in every instance. He speaks up. He speaks in his authority. He grants authority to his students. Uh, the world in which we live, men are afraid to take responsibility, not knowing that with that comes uh, authority. And I think the world, of course, denigrates men's authority, but wants to continue to uh, uphold this sense of, well, false responsibility, things that we're supposed to do that in reality do not serve our state as men. So I just think it's important that if we're talking in terms of like emulating Christ, well, then receive and exercise the authority by natural law and divine law that uh that is evident in the body of man step up be strong say no uh even if it means being hated that's another thing we're afraid to be hated we're afraid not to be honored i've been reading the uh, litany of humility and it rings so true that is all these things that we're trying to achieve by being good boys or not wanting to upset the apple cart all of which relinquish authority. There's this sense in which men have been made to believe that anger is bad. But St. John Chrysostom says that lack of anger is a sin. And Aquinas said that the virtuous man won't be afraid to bring sorrow to those he lives with if it's about correcting sin. So sometimes, like with Jesus in the temple and whipping, this has to be done as a man. And part of the sexual revolution was about men running away from that responsibility. And we've made the point previously about the playboy being the man who has fallen for the honey trap of sexual pleasure outside the family without the responsibility and authority of the father role and leadership being emasculated because of that. The clues in the name, the playboy. Hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are Anger and Courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not remain the way they are. That's St. Augustine. That's for you, Joe. I know you love St. Augustine especially closely, but that, yes, men are afraid to be angry now, as, as Will and Elliot, Elliot just said. There's, a, there's this reminder often of Jesus's mercy or God's mercy. Um, and then there's this tendency to forget his justice. Uh, even with the term justice, there's this sense that, well, justice means uh, giving those who what they what they want, giving those who want what they want, whereas opposed to true justice means doing what's right. Uh, if it means telling your child no, if it means speaking out and telling the world no, if it means drawing the sword, 
that is done from a place of uh, responsibility towards justice and what's right. And it is our responsibility. Yeah, you see Jesus just bringing, uh, he's a, you know, the image of a, a king, right? King and priest. So he brings uh, discord, really, to both, both halves of the earth, you know, you Jew and Gentile at the time. So he, you know, he calls the Pharisees uh, whited sepulchers. And when he's questioned by the Romans, you know, and he, he says, you know, art, Pilate asks him, you know, art thou a king? And Christ says, thou hast said it, which, is, you know, is, is a resounding yes, really. So uh, kingship, uh, him, him being the, you know, the, the archetype for a king, really, uh, except uh, historical, you know, literal one, uh, you know, ends in death, uh, a brutal death and a crown with thorns you know, and suffer, you know, obviously suffering and, and laying down your life for your people. But it's not, uh, it's not, it, it is glorious, but it's not, you know, not necessarily glorious in the sense of instant gratification. And it's going to, you know, it's all going to be great. You know, but really, it's it's all one big uh, no to all of your subjects, I guess. Mm. Yeah, so coming to bring conflict, knowing what's involved, choosing to be born, and then the disciples themselves become a kind of band of brothers because you're born again in this new brotherhood of the spirit. So an analog for that is a kind of military comradeship because the, the word apostle literally means one sent. And where is Christ sending us? Into battle, ultimately, into spiritual battle. And this is a really important thing to focus on because he baptizes with the Holy Spirit and with fire as well, what the Greeks called thumos or masculine spiritedness. So why is this important? What is that fire or the energy there? I think one way to look at it is that on the cross, when he was offered the drug to relieve the pain, he turned it down. So the crucified criminals were traditionally given a sedative and Christ says no to it. Now, why? Why not take the pain relief? What's manly about this? Because if you relieve the pain, what are you offering? You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. you're just numb. Yeah, the pain, the pain is what pays the expiation. You got to pay the like Rocky Balboa says, if you if you want to dance, you got to pay the band. And that's according to one theory of the cross. The church hasn't actually uh, dogmatized any of the two or three major theories. But this one, this one we have in common with the Calvinists. It's a kind of um, um, expiatory atonement. And if you're not paying the pain, then what good is the act on that theory of the cross? This is why Braveheart at the end does the same thing. It's his, it's Mel Gibson's model, his exemplar of Jesus comes directly from that part of the New Testament. Yeah. Uh, and a man is great. Uh, recognized. Elliot? I'm sorry, Will. Uh, a man is known for what he's willing to do. And if we look uh, at the initiation process cross-culturally, there was always an infliction of pain. Now, of course, we have in pseudo initiation these days, if you're in a fraternity or some sort, they'll brand you or make you drink enough alcohol to potentially kill you. And that would be your uh, sacrifice in order to be brought into their circle. But ultimately, our ancestors, our fathers, our grandfathers knew that if, for example, this boy, um, when he gets the experience, Experience of having his body tattooed over you know several hours of the tapping of an of an iron knight needle into his body, or the knocking out of a tooth, or uh, you know the, the, sitting or standing in a pile of ants. Uh, that this sort of this sort of torture is not meant just to uh, be a form of uh, masochism or or, or 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 being a sadomasochist or just hurting the boy for the sense for the sake of hurting him but so that the ego can be destroyed. The baby boy ego gets an opportunity to be destroyed, broken down so that clean slate of true paternity, fatherhood, the imprint of God the Father can be placed on him. He can't carry that old self 
and the death to the old self comes in the form of that pain. That's it. And men know that this is the kind of leader they can respect. When Alexander the Great was leading his armies across the desert in the conquest of Persia, the men were running out of water and Alexander had a bit of water left in his flask. So he tipped it out onto the sands. And then as they were thinking of turning back, stripped naked in front of the armies and said, look at the scars on my body. They're all on the front. I've never turned to flee. And that's leading by example in the way that Christ, by refusing the pain relief and then standing forever and eternity, bearing the scars <coughs> of the crucifixion is a model too. So this is the kind of man that men can look up to because he's led by example. In the agony in the garden, what we've got then is this sense of struggle that men all crave and we know that fulfills us. And there's a great remark from Bruce Barton about the kind of leadership that Jesus offers. He says that it calls forth men's greatest energies by the promise of obstacles rather than pictures of rewards. The promise of obstacles, not pictures of rewards. One of the best ways to motivate men to do something is to tell them how hard it is, and what a struggle it's going mm. to be. And I think one of the big mistakes the church has made in recent decades is by preaching a soft gospel. Nothing turns men off faster, except probably acceptance of feminism and homosexuality, which are all forms of effeminacy anyway, because rather than take the flack for telling the hard truth about them, you would rather pander to the current whims of the time and say something that sounds nice rather than telling the truth. So a hard gospel, a hard message that demands that we aspire to face these obstacles is the key to winning men over. Absolutely. I would say that when I was attracted to uh, the Baha'i faith, when I was in my seeking life, very early in my 20s, uh, I became enrolled in the community during the time of fasting. I have a season of fasting very similar to Ramadan. For 21 days, there's uh, fasting from night to day. And it was that very challenge, that very fact that I get to suffer now for what I'm proposing and for what I'm uh, being uh, enrolled into that gave me great joy. Uh, the fact that we've turned Lent into such a specified uh, form of quote unquote austerity, but yet uh, Muslims still fast uh, the way that they have been for the, the length of their faith um, just shows why perhaps that's why the faith is losing uh, men and they're and they're and they're going towards faiths like Islam and you know of course the Baha'i faith being a branch of it still practice austerities. Where is that for us? Where is that for our men? Uh, you know, praying five times a day versus, you know, the, I don't even know if there's a, there's an obligation to pray. We know that we should pray, but uh, is it not under the pain of sin? And should it be communing with our Lord uh, multiple times a day, not just once? Like these should be hard and fast rules. I know once again, there's this, I, of course, it's, it's true, but it's, I think it's been taken to a perverted degree that we're saved by faith alone. Uh, I said it last week, and it, oh, it, it, it rings true for a lot of men that I think men want to do religion. Uh, we, we, want to, we want something to fight for. We want something to struggle for. We want something hard to do. And by giving men this sense that uh, it's okay, you don't need to fast. You don't need to pray. You don't need to, uh, you know, X, Y, Z in terms of mortifying the flesh and austerities. Uh, is a sort of a turnoff. It's it, it's weak. Yeah, yeah. It's funny that men, even atheist men. Me and Michael were talking about this last week. Want to bend the knee to something. So that something, if they're atheists, ends up being risible. You know, the environment or Mother Earth or Gaia or something like that, which is very very Gaia. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> It reminds you that supernatural faith is a natural virtue. 
It is a natural mm. virtue, and it's part of the natural virtue of justice to want to give to God what is God's. On the other point of the austerity of Jesus, even though he's loving and nurturing and all that, I, I would point you guys to this very manly dimension of Jesus' austerity. Most people forget that in Matthew's gospel, um, when Jesus orders his best disciple, get behind me, Satan, to Peter, this is a mere three verses, three lines, after Peter has just been told he's going to be the first pope. You have Peter on you, I build my rock, or uh, I build my church on you, the rock. And then you have Peter's confession of faith. And then Jesus says, I'm the, you know, I'm the Messiah. Peter acknowledges it. And then Jesus says, look, I'm going to be, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to have to go away. And Peter says, no, no, don't do that. He's, he's being a, being a girl about it. And then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So they just have this touching moment where Peter confesses his love for him, confesses his fidelity to him. And Jesus acknowledges it and says, you're my man. You are my man. You're, you're my go-to guy. And then right away, Jesus, even though he's not, he's not a hothead, he's not angry, but he has no problem bringing not peace but a sword. He's like, that's really wrong. I have to go to my death. Get behind me, Satan. You're tempting me. <laughs> Aquinas in his commentary on Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics says that truth must always be preferred to friends yes about Plato that, that, that's a, a great comment in Plato where he's, he's talking about I, I love the author of the theory of the forms which is a nice way of saying Plato <laughs> but I must, I must prefer truth to a friend and, and Aquinas makes a couple close, almost jokes about it in this commentary. I love that commentary. Yeah. So we need then a hard gospel. An easy one is going to turn men off. And this because uh, men need conflict. They need to know there's this spiritual war. And they need to know that in a sense, everything is at stake. And that is why a message of sin, damnation, hell, reminds men mm -hmm. what they are fighting for. And if you look at some of the Renaissance paintings of Jesus, the blood doesn't actually flow straight down like you would expect it to, according to the laws of gravity. It flows like sideways to the genitals. And the point of that is that the artist is highlighting the connection between masculinity and sacrifice. The blood flows to the male sex organ because this is what it is to be a man, self-sacrifice. It's the hardship involved in being a man built in right from the start. And then Tertullian also comments that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. This brings us back full circle to where we started with. Even surveying non-Christian cultures, the pagan religions, that masculinity and shedding blood are deeply connected. Absolutely. I had that quote lined out as well, Will. You, you picked out a couple of the exact same. I mean, the it's one thing to say, hey, I love living in the 21st century when you can theoretically be a Christian and have an easy life as well. It's been that way in all of the centuries of Christendom and the two or three centuries of post-Christendom. But now as we're returning from post-Christendom back to Christianity being the Neronian opposite of the world, widely acknowledged, the enemy of the world, which it's been the whole time, we just forgot it. We're having to wake up to the idea that Jesus said, the world hated me first, you're the apostles, it's gonna hate you too, I'm even greater than you and it hated me. So, blood of the martyrs, seat of the church, this reminds us that being I had a friend that, that said Christine, Christianity is about the three M's. My friend Joseph, one of the holiest lay, laymen I've ever known. Christianity involves mysticism, martyrdom, and monasticism. And none of these three subsets of Christian are supposed to be subsets. You know, every Christian is supposed to be a mystic, should pray like a mystic. Every Christian should fast like a monk. Every Christian 
should be prepared to be a martyr, if not a red martyr, at the very least a white martyr. A red martyr sheds his blood, a white martyr sheds, you know, his his good name, at the very least. And even though we can't, it would be committing suicide to go around and actually try to be martyred for no reason, the point remains that these are not three special subsets of the Christian man, mystic, martyr, monk. They are endemic to all Christians. We must at least be willing to risk being the mystic, the martyr, and the monk. So I think it's a great comment. The monks, when they went into the desolate desert places, saw themselves as deliberately seeking out battle against the devil. Yes. Those military metaphors are full everywhere in the monastic writings. Yes, sir. Tim, in the last episode, you made some good remarks about restrained power being really important in thinking about Jesus's masculinity. And there's a, a Baptist minister, Fosdick, who remarked that Jesus was the most tempted of all because he had the greatest powers to control. Let's talk a bit more about this and we can get into some slightly eyebrow raising territory here when we think about what would Jesus have been like as a womanizer, for example, the guy who can walk on water. Do you think he couldn't have done a good job of being Mr. Steal Your Girl? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a question of potential energy, right? What has more potential energy, a mug that's being suspended on a desk that's three feet high or a mug that's suspended on a desk that's 400 feet high. Now, obviously, it's the latter. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, should he have chosen to be Mr. Steal Your Girl, could have been the best ever. He could have been the greatest at whatever he set his mind to. Ordered task, he's the God man, the ultimate virtue of, uh, the ultimate instantiation of virtue and truth. Or he could have become disordered. He sit, he shared all of our nature aside from sin itself. That doesn't exclude temptation. Think about the devil tempting him. Think more provocatively, perhaps, about Caiaphas tempting him from on the cross when he said, if you're who you say you are, why don't you come down? Come down, show us what you got. Show us what's under the hood. Restrained power is the most based. Power is based. Men are attracted to it. Restrained power is twice as powerful a power because Jesus was suffering bodily, wanted to get out from under that. He is suffering in his morale because you got this punk talking smack right in your face as you're suffering bodily, and that's creating a suffering of the spirit, lying about you, saying you're not the son of God when you are. And with one, by giving in to this guy, Caiaphas, I could, I could undo all my sufferings. But no, I will go through those sufferings because I am the, <laughs> raise some more eyebrows, I am a million fold Nietzsche's Ubermensch. You know, Nietzsche's Ubermensch looks like a, a gnat compared to the God man, Christ, and his restrained power in all his glory. Right. Is the complete opposite of small man syndrome. So if you're a guy walking down the street and you get challenged and you feel like you've got something to prove or you're a bit insecure, you might respond to that. But some of the biggest, toughest guys won't even turn their heads if they're insulted. They'll just keep walking because they don't want to smash the guy's face in and kill him. They'll just keep walking along and not respond whatsoever. So it's the true alpha that restrains the power. And it's the small man syndrome guy who will respond quickly and flare up so this is magnanimity in the aristotelian sense literally having a giant soul that's what that means for people out there uh to have a giant soul and the absence of bitterness as well so attributing the enmity of his enemies to ignorance Forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. Now, this is the opposite of the victim narrative, which will always seek to blame and find fault and bitch about people. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. 
That's a good, I mean, nowadays we have the inversion of that. Christians, Catholics, you see it everywhere on Catholic Twitter. Oh, I'm so sick of this. The passive aggressive inversion of, of Jesus sincerely praying for his enemy and teaching us to sincerely pray for his enemies. Whereas the worst insult you can pay to someone on Twitter, on Catholic Twitter, is to say, well, man, this guy's really, really cuckoo. I'm going to go home and pray for him. We should all pray for this guy. It's completely insincere, and it's actually a lashing out. It's a striking out through prayer. <laughs> That's not what Jesus was doing. He was literally praying to his Father, his Heavenly Father, for the souls of his enemies. The greatest act of restraint, power. Amazing. To round things up then, what I'd like to do is just suggest some thoughts for further reflection and just give the listeners some final ideas about paganism and pantheism as ultimately feminine. So what do we have regarding God and masculinity in Christianity then? We've got a God who creates ex nihilo, so out of nothing rather than out of his own substance. So this isn't pantheism and it's not paganism. There's no sense in which it comes out of the womb of nature. This is a <coughs> masculine form of creativity. God is separate from creation. We've also got the fact that when God takes on human flesh, he does so as a man. The incarnation involved God getting a woman pregnant. The Holy Trinity is just as we expect from just looking at things by natural reason alone. A trinity of a father, first of all, God is masculine. He doesn't create out of his own body. A son and the Holy Spirit. We've also got the fact that all created things depend on God in a way that's similar to how a family depends on its father. He provides for us, literally, our existence in every moment, sustaining things in being. He also has authority over us that's similar to how a father has authority over his family. And then we've got the point that Christ provides for and protects the church in the way that a father does for a family as well. I would also note that many, or if not all, pagan faiths are geared toward earthly power. It's about what can I get, what kind of insight, can I receive? What kind of power can I get from this particular deity or this stone or this thing, this created thing? How can it enhance my life when God becomes or when God is recognized as the father? It's a liberation from all of that. That's our God is up. You know, there's this knock against Christians and Catholics that we have a sky daddy. Well, that makes perfect sense. Because otherwise, what it becomes is your created mother, your earth mother. And that is all geared towards sensual gratification, the support of the ego, what I get, the power, earthly power. Or what the, God, what the Father God, the God above, shows us is that it's a letting go of these things and a, and a true faith in what we can't see and what is above us and what is a pattern rather than matter but that sky daddy idea is mistaken if it's meant to imply that this is all about seeking safety and comfort because so much of what we've covered today is actually the masculine role is about sending the child into danger to go and face the world it's about imposing hardship and discipline and training for that that's right yeah, discipline and hardship uh, and mortification against the flesh, uh, detachment from these things that are uh, more of the, the pagan or the created or the mommy nature that is always calling us back. Will and Elliot, I'd like to read you something that's so, biz I mean, not bizarrely, so strikingly apposite on all fours with the two remarks you just made that Benedict the Sixteenth wrote in his uh, book, the God of Jesus Christ, Meditations on the Triune God. Listen to how this Benedict quote unites both of the two points you just made bizarrely perfectly. If human <laughs> existence is to be complete, we need a father in the true meaning of fatherhood that our faith discloses. 
namely a responsibility for one's child that does not dominate him, but permits him to become his own self. This fatherhood is a love that avoids two traps, two extremes, he means. The total subjugation of the child to the father's wills and uh, priorities, uh, father's own priorities and goals on the one hand, and the unquestioning acceptance of the child as he is under the pretext that this is the expression of freedom on the other. Like, oh, he wants to be gay, so let him be gay. Responsibility for one's child means the desire that he realizes own innermost truth, which sounds relativist, but then he adds, which lies in his creator. Perfect middle way. That's Amazing. spot on. Yeah. Joe, any, any final thoughts on the discussion today? Uh, I think uh, aside from the fact that what you're doing is just uh, quite important and needed. By the way, is my audio okay? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, good. Yeah, I, I had to unplug, uh, unplug my headphones. But yeah, I mean, actually to that point, um, it the <coughs> pagan ideal kind of needed to be uh, undone because, I mean, for the Romans and the Greeks and, and all that, uh, the non-Judaic cultures, the, uh, the gods of their, their, uh, their religions were basically just um, these sort of arbitrary beings that sort of had the same desires and the same vices, really, as the people did. The only difference between them was that they could kind of squash it like a bug if they wanted to. So it was just all completely, completely arbitrary. And uh, I mean, the better philosophers of the time, like obviously, but you know, Plato and Socrates, you know, they're put on trial, you know, Socrates is put on trial for not believing in them at all. And, uh, you know, yet the religious sense and the statue of the unknown God, uh, we all knew, we all have this, uh, you know, census divinitatis, if that's, uh, I think Calvin's term, uh, that, that it's there, that the fulfillment of, I mean, I guess the forms in a way is there. Yeah. What are we facing then in the, the the challenge of trying to bring men back to the church? Ultimately, I think it's that the message has been too soft. We've stressed again and again that what men are actually called to is hardship, a kind of band of brothers, initiation, struggle and sacrifice. And to finish off, what I'd like to read out is a passage from Derek Wilson's biography of Charlemagne. He writes of Charlemagne and Co. They were men who believed simply, felt passionately, saw complex issues in black and white, were aggressive in word and deed, and understood this world as but a shadow of a greater reality. And it is mm. because they were the men they were, heroes in every sense of the word, that they turned the tide of events, took hold of a culture that seemed doomed to extermination by superior forces and forged the civilization of which we are the heirs. Now, the time has come again for men like that, with that kind of vision. In some sense, this is a world of black and white. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I, you have to be pretty base to call yourself Constantine Reborn. And <laughs> this shows why Charlemagne is base enough to pull it off. I'm looking forward to the next discussion, guys. I can't wait. It's been a pleasure today. Yeah, same Thanks here. So Appreciate you guys. Yeah, Joe, we got We got uh, We got to contact Martyr Maid. I'm not sure if he's Catholic or just ecumenically Christian, but he's been doing a lot of the same themes that we have. And I've, I've he came on my show once with you, me, you, and yeah, him yeah. had a good discussion, kind of about neo stoicism or something. I, I'd love to. I'd love to get his take on the Christian masculinism project and, and have him on and see, see how Catholic his ideas are. We, we should, we should try to try to get him on one of these upcoming shows. That would be nice. That Sounds would be nice. Also, I, I, I was talking, uh, if you guys are interested in this to Royce white behind the scenes, he's been all over Twitter lighting it up. And, um, he said, he said, oh, yeah, I haven't watched any of your guys' uh, early podcasts yet on the sea mask stuff, but what, how, you know, summarize what you've said for me. And I was like, well, here's what our three shows have been on. He's like, wow, that's, that's the direction that 
you know, Western civilization needs to go in. So I, I just want to say again, I, I think we'll get some really powerful allies and al alliances yeah. are important, uh, not in the sense of dependence, but in the sense of uh, mutual independence and the alignment that, that uh, the strength that arises out of mutual independence with uh, fellow travelers. So I, I think we're going to have some exciting, very manly guests on future podcasts. And uh, I, it was it was fun to have Joe today. And, and Will, thanks for hosting again Thank today. You. We're just getting going, people. Uh, anyone out there listening, watching? I, I have a million ideas with where we can go. Every single one of our podcasts is not going to be introductory like this. You know, Christians need to be masculine. Christians can be masculine. It's going to be some dimension of Christian masculinism. But we had to, because it's such a badly needed like topical government uh, coverage, we had to do some important sort of broad, more broad than deep uh, initial shows. And we're, we're getting really good feedback, but we're going to do some deeper than broader shows in the future. And I, I really just look forward to doing it with, with um, all of you guys. So thanks for hosting today, Will. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks, Will. So guys, where can people find more of your content online? Joe? Uh, I do, uh, like I said, I do a weekly show on the Kennedy Report with Kennedy Hall. I have a couple articles for uh, 1 Peter 5. I am on Twitter at here to help underscore 18. Uh, it's JJJ. So if you see me there, uh, that's about it. Tim? I'm on Twitter at Timotheology with two E's. Find my YouTube channel. Hopefully, everybody here uh, now knows it. Timothy Gordon. The show is Rules for Retrogrades. This C Mask show will be there next Friday. And go to timothyjgordon.com for my Retrograde Academy. Thanks. Elliot. YouTube, right where you are. You can just go look up my name, Elliot, two L's, two T's, H U L C. I got a channel dedicated to masculine excellence and one dedicated to strength training. Also more of an Instagram guy than a Twitter guy, but now that I'm seeing Twitter being unleashed, uh, I might start tweeting out too. So you can find me on Twitter if you'd like to follow me there as well. Brilliant. And then you've got me here on YouTube. I'm on Twitter, Nolan knows. And then Substack as well. I've got channel strikes on YouTube. I was kicked off Twitter, but Substack has been good to me. So subscribe there. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks so much. Until next week. Take care. God bless. God bless. God bless.